Welcome to the European Rotors Digital Series. The panel today is on eVTOL propulsion systems, state of the art and certification. We'll hear about the current state of, of electric propulsion systems within the eVTOL segment for several key players. Initially, we planned this panel at the European Rotors 2020, but now we meet virtually because of COVID-19 pan pandemic, as you all know. I'm Willy Tacke, uh, aviation journalist, co-founder of the eFlight Expo at Aero and publishing about electric aviation since then or even before, because electric aviation is a very fascinating sector and I think we'll see much more of this in the future. Our guests today are Olaf Otto, Rolls-Royce Electrical, Martin Dvorsky, MGM Compro, Oliver Reinhardt, Volocopter, and Rezich Rosotto from EASA. As we will start the panel and with the time which you will watch on the screen, we don't have too much time, so we'll start very quickly. I think I will hand the word for our first speakers and uh, Olaf will introduce himself and what Rolls-Royce Electrical is doing on electric aviation since the last years and especially in the field of eVTOL. Very happy to share some information from the point of view of Rolls-Royce with you. Um, Rolls-Royce um, Electrical has been active in um, electrical uh, mobility for, uh, for, for, for quite a while. Um, the way that we see the markets at the moment is that there are three um, early markets that are going to be present um, in the world. So we see that there's going to be a small propeller market, an eVTOL market, and a commuter aircraft market. And these are going to become real real um, in terms of being uh, proper markets where we see um, active aircraft in service um, within this decade. And Rolls-Royce is preparing products for launch um, in these markets within this decade. And of course, the eVTOL market is one that is, is very, very fascinating because it's a market that has um, just a huge variety of aircraft that um, are brand new from a point of view of the concept and the way that they um, are going to work. And it's going to be very interesting to see how this um, pans out from a uh, from, from all aspects, from a certification aspect, from a technological aspect, from a from an acceptance aspect, it have, they have the potential to revolutionize what is currently happening um, in aviation and really um, transform that third um, dimension of mobility, I think, for all of us. Um, we've, been, we've been active um, in a number of areas. Um, uh, I think the most well-known is our um, collaboration um, with, with Airbus. Um, we've um, built the um, propulsion um, system, the electrical machines, the inverters, the energy distribution center um, that is powering the um, city Airbus. You see a picture here of the city Airbus in flight. <clears throat> and we've been testing um, the system in flight um, with, a, with, a, with a first hover um, at the end of last year. And it's been running um, smoothly without any um, issues or malfunctions throughout um, 2020. Uh, it's been a very um, exciting year for the test campaign. Um, we've um, uh, seen the aircraft being taken through a large number of different stages and, and paces, um, and um, it's um, given us um, a lot of uh, learnings um, that we are going to take forward into our next versions. Um, so I've already um, said a little bit about the propulsion system, and you can see the way that the architecture is laid out here. Um, inside um, the, the city airbus. So we have um, uh, the uh, eight um, uh, 200 kilowatt motors. We have the um, eight inverters that uh, control these uh, motors and we have the power distribution centers that set in, sit in the body um, of the aircraft. Um, so a, a multi-copter um, application um, that is actually also flown um, quite high by now. This is a picture of um, one of um, the recent tests, as you can no doubt see by the um, by the weather in the background. Um, so um, it is a very um, 
exciting program for us. Um, the technology that we see flying at the moment um, in, in the city Airbus um, is, is not the technology that is um, eventually going to power the products that we're going to see um, in the in the air. It is it, it works. It's, uh, it's it's great technology, but there is a step change that is needed in terms of making systems that are um, both power dense enough, but also that meet all the requirements from failure rates and certification uh, from a certification point of view. Um, this is one of the examples that we are currently testing. So this is a, a this is just a different topology, a, a transversal flux machine that we currently have in the lab <clears throat> that has some unique features in it, which um, uh, uh, explore some different areas of the design spectrum. There's a lot more that uh, needs to be done to make sure that um, we fully explored that spectrum, but um, we're very confident that um, we'll be able to uh, basically take um, a product roadmap forward also for the EV toll space to provide um, products that are going to be ready for entry into service um, well within um, this decade. Um, that's all that I have as a, as, as a short teaser. Um, we really want to um, take uh, products forward in the market. Um, I, I think the time for um, for demonstration flights um, is, is, is done. I think everybody knows that you can get something into the air. I think now, now it's the question of um, taking these objects and bringing them to products um, and, and ensuring that um, our um, overall supply chain is basically at a stage where the airframers can use the objects that we're making and um, produce um, good aircraft. Thank you, Olaf. And I think I have some questions, but we wait with the question until the end of the session. So uh, uh, our next guest is Martin Dvorsky. I think his company in Czech Republic works as same as long on electric motors, a little bit more in silence than uh, Rolls-Royce and before Siemens. So yeah, Martin, give us a view of which are and where are the projects on which you're working now, especially in the VTOL sector. Thank you, Willy, and thank you as well for uh, being a part of this uh, panel discussion. So, you know, like you already said, my name is Martin Worski. I'm from company MGM Compro, and uh, our company is industrial producer of electronic components and uh, and uh, simply uh, a lot of. Uh, accessories and stuff for complex electric propulsion units. You know, uh, so our portfolio consists of, uh, like I already mentioned, the complex electric propulsion systems. And uh, our portfolio covers the, I would say the ranges from a few kilowatts up to something like 450 kilowatt continuous power currently. Uh, our company has the design and development and as well the manufacturing all under one roof. Uh, so our facilities include as well the R&D. We are like uh, 30 years on the market and uh, our team consists of about 50 professionals and our products are currently exported to more than 50 countries. Uh, just on the beginning uh, to summarize, let's say the global eVTOL scene, uh, the market size within the 2035 should be according to expectation uh, really a large industrial sector and uh, just in cargo with 4 billion US dollars in passenger like 33, 32 billion dollars and as well a few billions in supporting services. So this should be a strong market. I will I will talk in my presentation as well uh, on uh, other projects that MGM Compro is doing for the electric flight. Unfortunately, we cannot talk about all of them due to a lot of NDAs, but in general, uh, I would say uh, our electric propulsion systems and the components that we produce, like, uh, like I already mentioned, we produce uh, inverters, the, the speed controllers, and the battery management systems, then the complete uh, battery units, and uh, simply all the accessories which is needed for electric propulsion. And this is all used, for example, in already mentioned EV tolls. We have like uh, 15 running projects, and mostly the power promoter is something like uh, between 20 and 80 kilowatt. Then we have a lot of UAV projects. Uh, there is a lot of them already flying and uh, mostly the, in this sector, uh, our customers are using the power uh, in, in the range between five and 30 kilowatt per motor. And then there is a sector of, of the self-launching gliders. 
this is uh, I would say already existing market and uh, there is a lot of electric powered uh, gliders among the customers already uh, we have as well many projects uh, there are about 11 of them all, uh, running and uh, you can see it for example our unique solutions for example on a GP glider and of course MGM Compro is in this field uh, of the electric aviation, I would say, almost since the beginning, as we, we, we cooperated on many pioneering projects like the Airbus IFAN, Airbus Cricri, and Vector EPOS, uh, Electric Phoenix, and many, many others. So there is, I would say, uh, many aircrafts already flying uh, in the air, and we are working on many other projects uh, meanwhile. So uh, currently, the question will be definitely the certification requirements, for the future. And now on the next slide, uh, I'm going directly to the eVTOL project. I would say that uh, one of the most interesting where you can find the MGM Compro propulsion units is the XTI aircraft, the XTI Trifan. You know, this project uh, consists of uh, four electric motors and there is uh, one Honeywell turboshaft. Uh, so it's like hybrid. The, combustion engine works for uh, regenerating of the power. And uh, this aircraft is already, uh, or let's say, already have the successful stage of uh, validation flight test, uh, which was done in May of 2019. And I really think there is a very interesting future uh, in front of us in regards to this project. As the next one, where we cannot say uh, a lot of details, but we can at least say some basic information is the Bell APT aircraft, which is as well the eVTOL. And uh, after the takeoff, uh, do the transition and then it fly like a classical aircraft. Uh, it have a multi-mission use and the payload uh, for this aircraft is uh, up to 35 kilograms. Cruise speed is like 120 kilometers per hour and the flight range goes up to 105 kilometers. As the next project where you can find the unique technology of MGM Compro is uh, a Cantas project of the Czech company New Space Technologies. I would uh, like to mention this project because this project because of uh, some unique features. As you can see, this type of aircraft is using uh, two electrical engines for vertical takeoff and landing. And in this configuration, it's uh, really crucial that there, if there is a failure this aircraft will definitely fall down. So in this configuration and in this project, we focused on uh, developing very unique redundant system. So we can really uh, increase uh, the probably like, simply, we are almost sure that uh, I think uh, there will be no failure during these stages, no matter that you have only two electric engines. On the next slide, there is a do for aerospace project. Uh, this one is very promising, and uh, let's see from the configuration point of view, it's very similar to, for example, uh, well-known uh, Airbus Vahana. So it's uh, the eVTOL, which looks like a classic aircraft, and uh, during the startup, it has the tilt wing configuration, so it, it has a classical uh, vertical takeoff, and then during the flight, it do the tilt wing, it tilts the wing and flies like a classical aircraft. Uh, this unique project as well focus on very low noise and uh, it's already flying in a, in a scaled model. Uh, so you can see a lot of videos on, as well on YouTube already. And uh, this project is, is uh, I would say, uh, going ahead pretty fast. So I, I'm sure that very soon we will see a lot of progress regarding, regarding this one. Uh, on the next slide, you can see uh, of the projects of MGM Compro, uh, what we did for electric uh, aviation industry. And I'm sure you can see a lot of uh, multinational companies and renowned uh, companies that we delivered uh, for the electric propulsion systems. And uh, at the end of my presentation, I would like to mention that, uh, uh, in my opinion, the e aviation is not uh, in the pioneering era anymore, which is clear. And like Olaf said already, Within this decade, we will see a lot of uh, projects to be, be brought to the market and used uh, by the customers in, in, in real everyday life. And uh, that's very important. So I would say that uh, we are living in extremely interesting times and uh, 
the future will bring probably a lot of interesting projects. Very interesting point of view, especially to see that very different companies like the huge Rolls Royce or the small MGM Compo working in the same field and both bringing aircraft into the air. And our next guest is from one of these manufacturers of the aircraft. Welcome, Oliver Einhardt from Volocopter. Uh, let us know how you're using these small little things which bring the uh, aircraft into the air with as low as noise as possible. We are uh, not just an OEM, as Willie mentioned correctly. Um, our final target as a business model is to really provide then transport services with an eVTOL aircraft to the market. As a necessity, we are developing the vehicle because the vehicle for that specific mission that we want to do in the direct urban context needs to be pretty specific and special. In my presentation, I, I will have a look at different um, aspects, what is behind getting the eVTOL certified and the, EV, uh, the electric propulsion system especially certified in there because yeah, we are entering something new in here. Is it new? Is it maybe not so new? Let's have a look what makes it special. So far, we know pretty well what we can expect when we are speaking about vertical uh, takeoff and landing aircraft, which today are the rotorcrafts. I mean, we have the single engine rotorcrafts, we have the twin engine rotorcrafts, and we know very well how to design them. We know very well what kind of heart is beating in them, how it is constructed, how it is set up, what the technology is behind. And we have a long standing experience together with the authorities also how to certify these kind of vehicles in there. Now comes the eVTOL aircraft. And here you see our Volocity aircraft, the aircraft that we will be using for the urban air taxi mission, flying from hub to hub, um, being operated directly by us in this urban context as the air operator in there and having a very specific design in there. Willy already mentioned a lowest noise profile in there. Yes, from the testing that we already have done, from the noise testing, we could conduct also together with the ASA in some research projects with our flying prototypes, we could find that um, we are very likely to have the lowest noise profile with this kind of concept in there. But there is something behind that makes this possible. And that's what we are seeing here. The picture before was showing two or one engine. We have 18 of them on board of the aircraft. These 18 lift thrust units, they are powered by nine battery blocks. So again, something that makes it special. And it's a highly distributed installation. And that's really something where the electric propulsion system is, is a clear enabler for that technology, as it allows us to do such a distributed installation. There would be no chance with classical propulsion systems to do something like this and get anyhow close to such a concept as we are developing in here. There is a difference between rotorcraft and between our eVTOL aircraft in the way how they are flying. And that has a direct implication on how we need to certify these engines in there and the full propulsion systems in there. On a classical rotorcraft, we have the engine, we have mechanical flight controls, we have gear drives in there. And in essence, this is providing the lift, the thrust and the control of the rotorcraft. Plus for the hopefully very unlikely case when we are losing the engine, we have some backup control possibility of the aircraft Namely, we can do auto-rotation landings on the aircraft. Looking on the, uh, on the VTOL aircraft, like our Volo City here to the right, flying nicely over Berlin, we have an electrical motor, we have electronics, and that's basically providing our lift, thrust, and control. And that's it what can provide lift, thrust, and control. So the overall aircraft architecture needs to very well consider that when we, for the case, we would lose all of the lift thrust units, we actually have no backup. We have no auto rotation capabilities and none of the concepts that are in development are having these capabilities. So that's definitely one of the aspects we have to take into account when really looking into what makes it efficient, how efficiently we can define, def uh, design, size, and then certify these aircrafts. Next aspect that comes into the play in there classical aviation engines. They are manufactured since quite a while. There are known players in the field that are actually developing it. They are strong on the market and they know what they are doing. 
with electric engines, yeah, we see some established players um, like here also on the panel with Rolls Royce, but most of them are really new kids on the block that are coming in there. So there is a suspicion that the experience for these developers, designers, manufacturers, and bringing the products to certification might still be a little bit low. What effect does this have? Speaking of experience, looking at conventional aircraft engines, yes, we have very nice statistics on how they behave, how many failure rates we have, depending from the installation into the different products in there. The FAA is giving us nice data, EASA is giving brilliant data in there that can be analyzed to understand where we are. Electric propulsion systems, what's the situation in here? Yeah, they have significantly less operational history at least in aviation, but the technology is not new. So it's not completely unprepared turf that we are entering into, but we need to look beyond the fences in order to understand what the kind of reliabilities are that we properly can expect in a propulsive environment for these kind of propulsion systems in there. So taking it all together, one might think, okay, yeah, classical aircraft engine is a known animal. When certifying electric propulsion for eVTOL aircraft, it still feels like we say in Germany, the Wolpertinger, so the unknown animal that is in front of us. Is this really still the case? There is no real need to shy away because in essence, it is there, it is flying and it is operated. Here you see quite a number of pictures from the different flight missions that we were doing with our different products. Actually, right at this point in time, we are developing the fourth generation already of our VTOL aircraft, which is the aircraft which is in the middle of the EASA type certification process. We have done quite a lot before. We are flying actually since 2011. That was when this famous first flight with our flying yoga ball took place to uh, to underline, technically, it is possible to get a human into the air with the electric-driven multi-rotor concept. That was a kickoff then for the product that we see in the left uh, column over there, our so-called White Lady, the VD200, which was flown in quite different environments. We were flying it manned in 2016. We were flying it in Dubai in the desert environment in 2017. And all the experience we took from there did lead to our 2X, which is uh, on the bottom and the right lowest picture in there, which we are flying since then. For example, in the airfield environment, uh, integrated to the airspace at the Helsinki airport, which was a manned flight, or flying it unmanned in Stuttgart, within the city limits of Stuttgart, in front of 12,000 spectators, watching it and experiencing the incredibly no no low noise profile of this aircraft or flying on the right side in the heart of Singapore last autumn, where we also had the impressive effect that when we did our rehearsal flight over the Marina Bay with hundreds and thousands of tourists walking around, the tourists didn't even notice that we are flying there because they plainly couldn't hear it. So that was a pretty impressive demonstration of the possibility of that technology. Or then on the right top, our Volo drone, uh, the VD-200, which is a derivative from our manned aircraft in there for cargo transporting using the same technologies in there. So looking at all of this, as we speak today, we are clearly beyond 1,000 flights on the different prototypes in there. We have clocked significant data and significant experience with these electric propulsion driven vehicles. So back to the question from before, is it the unknown animal? Maybe on the certified end, yes, still a bit the unknown animal. Uh, but by experience that is available from operating it, there are many, many years of operation available and if personally I look back, I mean, my first electrical aircraft I was involved with the ICARI 2 of the University of Stuttgart was back in 95, which is still flying. So yes, we have quite some experience we can build upon. So uh, where are we and what must we keep in mind in order to get the electric propulsion finally certified? It's new in aviation maybe, but it's not really uncommon. So let's clearly remember this. Then the way of integrating uh, electric propulsion into an eVTOL aircraft explicitly is completely different to classical propulsion system integration. 
What it requires from us is to really look at the full vehicle and architecture. It's quite difficult to really treat it in isolation. Yes, you can treat it in isolation, but the effect that we are clearly seeing, and that was also part of the trade-off that we were doing, do we develop our propulsion system ourselves? or do we purchase it from electric propulsion system providers as our other two fellows here on the panel today? For us, the conclusion in the end was pretty clear to say we develop it ourselves because it has to be seen really in the context of the complete architecture of the system and only by doing the proper trade-offs in the architecture, uh, in the power association, in really the design operating points actually on spot for that specific application. That's how we get the maximum efficiency out of it. And the same we see with respect to certification. We need to really certify the complete aircraft, the complete vehicle, and take the benefits in safety, in reliability from where we can take them best. Established methods from legacy engine certification, they do not carry over one by one. You really need to take a fresh view on how you test, how you qualify, how you certify these engines. So the approach we've done it always this way doesn't really work out here. One of the lessons learned we made there as well. Of course, it's new, be cautious, but please don't be anxious. There are new things involved clearly in these kind of systems, but there are many, many aspects that are significantly less complex than on conventional aircraft engines and propulsion systems. And last but not least, uh, what we clearly see here is we need to learn jointly, industry and authorities. We need to do a balanced approach, no overkills. And in order to do this, we need to be very transparent from us as industry towards the authorities to explain them what we are doing, to share if we have failures in what we are doing, to jointly learn so that we really can do the crawl, walk, run approach also on this novel technology in here. This also includes then adjust where needed. So try not to do the overshoot on the safe side from the beginning try to find the most feasible leveled balance uh, in the certification expectations in there, and then adjust where we see we need to do a little bit more, relax where we can do a little bit less. That's a way how we can enter the market, and that's a way how we can provide safe vehicles. Thank you, Oliver, and a uh, very interesting point of view, especially seeing that you say there are motor manufacturers uh, around, but we have to develop it on our own for having it most fitting to our aircraft. We heard about a lot about technology now uh, in the last minutes, um, but there is more. Before we can see this aircraft going into the air, um, they have to be certified. Volocopter was already flying quite years ago, but um, as an ultralight. Now, saying it is a professional transportation service for either persons or goods. It definitely has to be a certified aircraft. And that's got Volocopter to EASA, one of the first customers for certifying a VTOL for EASA. Now we have the honor to have a guest from EASA, Resis Rosotto. You're working on the certification of electric motors on the other side, on the certifier side. So please give us a view how the authority sees the certification and where are the main features which you have to test. Thank you, Willy, for the invitation and to be yeah, to let me provide an update on where we are on the other side on the electric and hybrid propulsion system certification. Um, that's really interesting times uh, that we are all sharing at the moment and we try in EASA to be part of it and to support it. Indeed, as, as you have seen um, and as uh, the other panel have mentioned, there are a lot of projects ongoing uh, everywhere in the world, especially in Europe. We are quite lucky on this uh, on this aspect and we try on EASA to support that as much as we can. So obviously our first mission is to ensure the safety of the products. That's quite obvious, I guess. But we need to support innovation as well. And why we need to support innovation? Basically, because we believe that it will, it will as well uh, bring safety in the future when it's going to be a mature. So far, as an authority, uh, we have a different challenge. It's not really a purely technical challenge, but the challenge we face at the moment is that we see a really large number of different propulsion architectures. I mean, we have seen it in the presentations of the other panel, and that 
led us to think a bit out of the box. What is now an engine? How should we consider a propulsion system? So we started to work um, basically at the beginning um, of electric aviation on a case by case. Slowly, as we've seen the increasing number of projects, we say, okay, we need to step back and maybe we need to work on something a bit more generic. Um, and that's why we started to work on the special condition electric and hybrid propulsion system. So the intent was to be objective based, uh, like the CS23 Amendment 5. We want it to be as well technology agnostic, on that because we believe if we want to cope with innovation, um, we should not put any showstopper on any limitations in the requirements we're going to propose. And also, obviously, we wanted to bring proportionality. Uh, obviously, we cannot request the same level of safety for all the products we will certify. We started to work, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, on a case by case uh, at the, in the last years. Um, so we developed a set of requirements to support the ongoing certification projects. So you have here on the screen um, all the special conditions that are available uh, for the industry. They are mainly dedicated to single electric propulsion units uh, from cell planes to CS23, uh, level one aircraft. Um, I won't go into detail, but it's just an overview of what is already available in the ESA framework. Maybe just a few words on the, on the last one, on the SCE18 that we recently issued uh, a few weeks ago. And this one is quite interesting because um, the aim of this one was to support the use of the ASTM standard, the F3338-18, uh, that we uh, supported actively in the, in the redaction with the FAA. And we wanted to have with the FAA a joint approach on, on this matter. And we wanted to make use of these standards on both sides of the Atlantic. But obviously, um, as I mentioned, we were facing um, really a high number of projects uh, coming in, especially on the VTOL aircraft. That's why we started to work on the on the special condition E19. So you see here, there is a kind of, uh, of timeline that is provided. We started uh, in June last year to work on that. Uh, and we release uh, the proposed version uh, beginning of the year, 2020. Uh, maybe not the best time, but that's why we extended the, the consultation period twice due to the COVID situation. So the, the special condition E19 was intended to deal with all electric uh, and hybrid propulsion system for any kind of aircraft, any kind of intended aircraft application. And the, the idea behind was to have a, an a la carte concept. Um, so each applicant could come define the scope of his propulsion system and state, OK, among the requirements that you propose, I need to select this one, this one, and I will propose you dedicated means of compliance that will be depending, dependent on the intended aircraft application, but also dependent on the technology that is involved in the propulsion system. So where we are at the moment on this special condition, so the Consultation period ended mid-June this year. So we received uh, quite a high number of comments, roughly 500 comments. We've been really pleased by, by the, the comments we received. They really helped us to improve the special condition. I really believe it. And now we are working on those comments, obviously. And the next step, um, so we intended first to release the final version by end of the year. And you will see on the, on the next slide that it took us finally a bit more time. So we now target the beginning of next year to release it. Um, we are working in parallel uh, on the identification of the missing means of compliance for this special condition. And obviously, as it is an a la carte concept, um, the number of means of compliance that we could use um, can be uh, extremely high. So EASA will focus first on the means of compliance uh, that will be required to support the ongoing certification project. But today I wanted to uh, provide already a first feedback, even if I won't release the final version now, uh, I, I wanted to share with you today a few points, um, mainly related to the scope of the special condition, because that's where we received um, most of the comments. And uh, we decided to work on the scope on three different aspects. The first one was to remove from the scope of the special condition 
any uh, electric and hybrid propulsion system intended for low-end products. So basically, sail plane, LSA, and the small CA-23 aircraft. And why we did uh, that choice? It is because we believe that uh, the requirements that we have proposed in the special condition may not be so much appropriate for such category of products, maybe too demanding. But on the contrary, um, we decided to um, include in the scope the electric and hybrid propulsion system dedicated to CS25 aircrafts. Um, basically, um, the rationale behind this is because we believe the requirements are adapted to CS25 aircrafts. And obviously, uh, environmental requirements will have to be worked in parallel of this special condition. And the last point uh, that we are uh, intending to work on for the scope of the special condition is um, that finally the special condition may be used for electric and hybrid propulsion system in the case where the intended aircraft application or applications uh, is or are known. And why is this choice? Is because we believe it is of high importance to be able to derive the safety objectives from the intended aircraft application. As Oliver was mentioning, uh, it's quite important to have a, a, a wide view and to consider the aircraft in the end. Um, we may work in the future, if it is requested by the industry, um, we may work on a set of requirements for electric and hybrid propulsion system uh, when the intended aircraft application is not known. But so far, for the moment, we limit the scope, or we intend to limit the scope of the special condition in 19. So in the end, what does it mean for the special condition? It will address electric and hybrid propulsion system intended for CS-23, 25, 27, 29, VTOL aircraft, and airship. Last slide that I share uh, almost on all my presentation, just to give an overview on where we are um, active outside of EASA. Um, obviously, we are involved in a wide number of standardization bodies working group. Um, I believe you're all aware of them, and I won't go into detail in, in all of them. Uh, maybe a few points to highlight. Uh, the cooperation, the internal cooperation we have with other authorities. So, and especially with the FAA since 2016, we really try to work jointly. And our intention um, is to be technically harmonized. That's really the, the aim uh, to reach this on the propulsion system. Obviously, we are facing some limitations because we don't have the same legal framework. So we may be not uh, word by word, by word uh, or word for word, uh, fully, um, fully uh, equivalent. But technically, uh, we'd like to be uh, to be harmonized, and that's I believe important uh, for the authorities. But also, I believe it is also important for the industry. And that's that's it for my presentation today. Um, that's what I wanted to share with you. And thank you again, Willie, for having invited me. Thanks, Regis, and thanks to everybody. And I hope we could have everybody on the screen again. My first question would be to uh, Olaf. Um, you mentioned uh, that you have uh, on the market or you have several products which you now want to bring to the market after a time of testing out a lot of different things. When do you think the first eVTOL propulsion system can be certified and on the market from your side. So from from, from our side, we we're, we're expecting this, um, as I said, well within this decade. So um, I, I would I would say 25 to 26 plus minus would be a good time to have something available. Okay, thank you. Um, question two for Martin. You mentioned that you have an international partner as you're a small company and it's a very big field in which you're working uh, can you disclose with whom you will be working uh, in the future uh, yeah sure i can you know uh, honestly this is the cooperation regarding the electric motors smgm has a uh, really deep knowledge uh, about the motor control and all related uh, aspects so we now we are now launching the cooperation with the company which includes uh, the company like atb or shore and the name of the of this uh, international player is Wulong. Yeah, so so MGM Compro will now closely cooperate with Wulong on on the projects of 
electric uh, flying vehicles. Thank you. Question to Oliver. Um, you mentioned that you do your motors yourself, although there are several companies around which are producing. If, you, if one looks around into other fields like into aviation, very rarely uh, the airframe manufacturer makes its motors itself. Do you think it's just for the development phase and later you will find somebody who will make the motors? Or do you think you will be integrated producing the whole aircraft with most of the components? We are defining and specifying the motor to fit exactly to our aircraft and we are certifying the motor as a component of the aircraft because it is specifically tailored and an exact fit for that purpose in there. Uh, we are working together with the supplier landscape in there. So essentially then uh, on the detail design side, we have a very strong uh, subcontractor who is doing the detailed layout and who is very familiar and deeply into the systems that we are needing into this. And he will then also provide the, be the serial supplier to this. So on the production side, in the end, we will do the major assembly, the structure and the major assemblies in there, but that's a component that will be provided by that supplier in there. So we are we are cooperating with the supplier landscape by basically saying we do it ourselves. That was mainly related to saying we specified exactly for that product. We do not say we can use a motor that has been generically developed and could fit several purposes in there. It's exactly for that product and it's type certified with that product, not a standalone type certificate. Okay, thank you, Oliver. Um, another question I have now for Iasta, for Regis. Um, we, we talked about propulsion system. When we talk about propulsion systems in aircraft, generally, we mainly talk about the motor or on the turbine. Um, in the electric propulsion system, it's much more complex. When you certify a motor, it's more that you think you certify the whole system from the battery over the motor controller, over the battery controller to the motor itself, or will it more be different single certification for components and then the airframe manufacturer can put them together like it is a little bit on the normal conventional aviation side at the moment thank you really that's a very good question um many actors are, are asking the same question actually uh, we are working on the topic obviously um to to really identify how to certify an electric and hybrid propulsion system we have defined so far the technical requirements and whatever we're going to certify the the, pro, the system in the end the technical requirement should be identical we need to bring the same level of safety whatever the, the way we certify it but obviously we are looking at ways to certify propulsion system we have several ideas uh, in our mind so far and uh, we believe to be able to share this uh, maybe by uh, beginning of next year Thank you, uh, Regis. Uh, next question to Olaf would be, you talked about the supply chain, which now has to be built up, because I think this is a factor which a lot of people haven't considered up to now, because it's one to develop an aircraft, it's one to develop perhaps a motor. Um, when you talk about the supply chain, will Rolls-Royce try to manufacture most of the parts itself, or will it be that you design the core and then we'll have suppliers who supply you with, mo with most of the parts for having the system together? For example, batteries and controllers, will this be more your own design or will it be more the uh, suppliers which supply you the units? So I think I think this is something that depends very much on the, on, on the specific, um, subsystem or on the specific components so if you you, you spoke of batteries um I, I i don't really see a future where where rolls royce would be in the business of producing battery cells ourselves but um we do have the intent to provide full systems uh to the to the aircraft manufacturers and so a battery is, is part of that. And so we do have a program running internally, which um, aims to provide a cert type certified um, or certified battery, if you will, um, as well. And uh, with, the, with the design, then uh, that obviously comes from us, but then um, uh, individual um, components that make up the battery 
um, will of course have to be sourced um, in, in various stages from, from different suppliers. We're not going to make sales ourselves. Um, and the same um, then becomes true when you look at um, the other comp the other components um, of, of a hybrid electric propulsion system, such as um, electrical machines or um, the inverters, um, the distribution centers and the like. Thank you. Uh, we're nearly running a bit out of time. Uh, I would have a lot of more questions as this is really an in interesting topic. But um, so we uh, now a last question for everybody. And I would like to have a quick answer. Um, if possible, a short answer. Uh, in which country you think the first commercial eVTOL service will run? Um, the US. Okay. Martin? I would agree with US. Oliver? I kindly disagree. <laughs> we know pretty well what the competition is doing in there. And as we have announced recently, also we have a launching city here in Europe with Paris, uh, getting ready to fly commercially um, around the end of 22 uh, with the aircrafts in there. So far, I have not seen that anybody is anyhow nearer to getting this into commercial operation in there, including the air operator certificates that you need to really be able to get into the cities there. Thank you. Regis? Yeah, I would share the view of Oliver. I would go for Germany or France. Very good. So looking forward to see this. Um, many thanks for your contribution uh, to the panel. Very interesting insights from all of you. Uh, I think it was a good discussion because we had a lot of new things which we saw. Um, uh, the follow-up discussions we will definitely see, for example, at the next Arrow and hope face-to-face -face at the first European Rotus show, which will be happening from 16th to 18th November in Cologne this year. In the meantime, please all stay healthy and uh, talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.